So everyone, so today, kind of had a crazy idea to design an amplifier for Rhett Scholl. Now, some of you may or may not know who Rhett Scholl is. Hopefully you do. Uh, he's a very successful guitarist, YouTuber, and he's got a lot of gear. So I've had an idea for a while for using it's called a topology of an amplifier, one that doesn't really send any signal to ground for your tone controls. So you're getting as pure as possible signal through the amplifier, but still having the ability to adjust things like bass and treble. So this kind of does fit in with what I see as a whole in his arsenal of gear. Uh, his Favorite amplifier that he has is a 1964 Vox AC30. Great amplifier, collector's item, not something you want to take on the road. So building him something that doesn't have the historic value of the Vox, while giving him that sound, but also doing it in a very unique manner that is more suited for his playing style. And hopefully something he'll love for the rest of his life. So let's start looking at a schematic of a Vox amplifier and we'll see how we'll turn it into something unique and something totally awesome. All right, so this here is a schematic for a Vox AC30 treble model. Now a treble model is one that a lot of people may not be familiar with. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the top boost model where you have the treble and bass controls. However, this is very simple, two volumes. Uh, you've got a volume for your, quote, normal channel and a volume for your brilliant channel. A little bit of the schematics cut off here, but this is a single 12AX7 here. It has two independent plate resistors. Each of them are 220K. One side goes through this larger 0.047 capacitor. Then it splits off, goes through a 330K resistor up to a 500K volume pot. And then this 220 picofarad capacitor, it's kind of like a big bright cap here. Then it goes through another resistor and capacitor into the phase inverter. Now the Brilliant channel, same 220K plate resistor here, comes out, goes through a 500 picofarad capacitor, then through the same 330K, 220 picofarad bright cap, 500K here. This doesn't have any type of tone controls here. The only thing it kind of has is later on down, it has that cut control. So you can shape the highs, but you have no low control. So what if we turn this into something that's like a train wreck songwriter, matchless spitfire, where we parallel this 12AX7 together we use this as your bass control because this is this side is not letting a lot of bass through this brilliant channel not really thin sounding but is a lot thinner than this side so we can use this as a bass control and put everything through one side of the phase inverter here now let me show you what that looks like in a schematic so here's the 12x7 parallel together Got the inputs for the grids, cathode tied together with its resistor and capacitor, and the plates tied together with its resistor. Now here we have a bank of capacitors. The reason why I did this is a cool little feature we're going to have in a second that I'll show you. But we've got the 500 picofarad capacitor going straight across, just like the Brilliant Channel. Now getting into this uniqueness here, instead of that 0.047 capacitor, I've broken it out into two 0.022 capacitors. So when you run capacitors in parallel, you add them together and you get pretty much that value. So I've got a little switch here to break them out. And then a variable resistor here that ties back in. And then I've added in a 500 picofarad capacitor switch. So what this allows for you to do is to have the original 500 picofarad value these two together will give you about that 0.047 value or one of the things that a f another famous Vox player did, Brian May from Queen, 
was that this value here, instead of being 0.047, was actually 0.022. So with a switch, you can disconnect them, get that value. But he also used the treble booster, which had a higher value capacitor than this 500 picofarads. So put another one in parallel, get 1,000 picofarads here, get more of that mid-range. Let's go over the frequency responses, and you can see how that will work together. So using this parallel 12x7 design, it's going to give you some interesting frequency responses. So just using this 500 picofarad capacitor, you know, this rough drawing here, you'll get a lot of these high frequencies coming through. When we use the two 500 picofarads together, you'll get a, a shift down towards more of the mids. So we'll get that in here. Then on that base control, 0.047, you're going to have a lot of base frequencies coming through, but then it's just going to kind of be level here. With that 0.022, less base will be coming through. Now, when you combine them, you see there's overlap between these two. So you actually get what's called um, constructive frequency building. So instead of them being equal, they will actually build on each other and give a boost in that range. So with the 0.047 and 500, you'll get this kind of a shape. And with that 0.02 and 1000 picofarad, you'll get a shape like this with the dotted lines in there. So it will be a very well-suited frequency response for a guitar amplifier because you're gonna have a lot of mid-range in here. We're going to be cutting some of the lows off with it. And with that cut control that I'm going to wire the cor correct way around and turn it into like a treble control, you'll be able to tame these high frequencies down. So that's the preamp out of the way. So what about the rest of the amplifier? What about the power side? What, what tubes are we going to use for, say, phase inverter or the power tubes? And what's the output transformer going to be? Well, to me, those are a lot more simple than the preamp design because the preamp is where all the tone is, where you define the sound of it. Uh, so one thing about Rhett uh, in his signature amp that he did with Port City, he used all octal preamp tubes. Well, I wanted to use the 12AX7 for the first tube. That gives you a greater flexibility of trying different tubes, trying to find the one that sounds right for your need. But for the phase inverter... So I'm to go with this little 6SL7. Should be a very interesting little build, but there's schematics out there on the internet for how to develop a phase inverter for this, so nothing special there. For the power tubes, because we're going with this Vox style, I didn't just want to use regular EL84s. I wanted to use these special, so I can get the focus, 6N, 14N. Uh, Dr. Z loves these tubes. I love these tubes. They're basically a military spec version of an EL84. They take a lot of abuse. And in order to get these to sound right, they need to be abused. So for the output transformer, you know, we got two EL84s. Could go with a Vox AC15 output transformer. But that's a little undersized. So I'm going to go with a output transformer for a Marshall 18 watt build. They're oversized for what I need them to be because this is only going to be 15 watts, maybe 10. We'll see. Um, but it will give you a nice low end thunk because one of the things that happens with output transformers is the more you saturate them, the narrower the frequency response is. So if you're not hitting them very hard, you can get a much wider frequency response out of them. So you can get that low end thunk, like a 100 watt Marshall gives you out of a 412 cab. You know, love, you know, love feeling that on the stage. So the real truth is, maybe this amplifier already exists. Maybe Rhett's using it on tour right now. Don't know, have to stay tuned to find out.